The personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, this is Debbie Reynolds on the Data Diva Talks Privacy Podcast, where we talk about data privacy issues, about things that businesses need to know now. And today I'm very, very thrilled to have a very special guest, Tara Tallman Bosserin from the UK. She is a GDPR data protection IT consultant and voted a Privacy Hero of the Year. You're also, you had over 17 awards, many different publications. Uh, you and I met virtually on LinkedIn. You, you share so much interesting content and I would love for you to introduce yourself and talk about the things that are that interest you right now. Hello Debbie, hello, thank you for having me in your show. Uh, it's nice to see you and um, chat with you. We are both very active, I think, on uh, educating and talking and discussing about subject of data protection. Um, I've been involved for more than a decade on this subject since uh, I was a French corporate uh, lawyer and then I moved to Germany and then UK. And it's here that I specialized on privacy and data protection while I did my LLM. Um, originally, I was expecting to do child island safety until during my LLM, I actually realized that governments were sometimes using um, child protection um, to quieten uh, free speech. Uh, so I get involved with the reform of the data protection directive, which became then the uh, regulation um, GDPR. Um, I guess the, your auditor would know the difference between a directive and a GDPR regulation, which is a regulation that applies directly on all EU nations' um, legislation. It was quite an ambitious uh, program. Um, it could not be perfect because uh, within the 28 member states, there are some of civil law um, background and, and the others are common law like UK. So there has been tension uh, between the different um, legislations. I still believe that it's it's the best, um, well, not the best. No, I shouldn't say that. We we <laughs> it still need to be more perfect. But the big fine make everybody wake up. Everybody started to think, wow, GDPR data protection is actually important. I'm trying to explain how that we gain a lot with the digital world. I remember as a lawyer when we used to, secretaries used to type everything, lawyers would dictate and, and there was a secretary typing everything and if something was uh, wrong, they had to start it all over again. Well, internet has made the lawyers work much, much easier. Everyone's work is much easier automated. We do search on Google, which brings out so many results in just one click and all for free. Well free, maybe not, but we don't pay straight away. <laughs> um, so yeah, GDPR with the fines wake up. Um, data protection authorities, in my view, have been a little bit too slow to enforce, but here comes the um, COVID and uh, confinement, which also changed a lot of the um, situation. Working from home is, is different. I've been looking and following the cases of cyber attacks, which I guess, Debbie, you've seen the same. They're just going high up the ceiling. Um, working from home means less security, obviously. Uh, so it needs its training. I'm not sure every employer get the training they needed. We had in UK a very interesting case, a Morrison case, which went up to the high court of... Uh, Vicarious liability of an employer for his employee. In, in the case, the supermarket Morrison mostly hadn't done anything wrong, apart from having a employment fight with the employee. They sacked the employee. It happened the employee was working in the accounting department. Uh, he was asked to um, forward the whole uh, 
HR data to the um, outside accountant audit. Um, meanwhile, he copied it on a USB stick, and when he gets sacked, uh, well, the whole HR data was published online. That caused a major issue and big problem for all the employees who had their data exposed. There was a class action. Uh, the Court of Appeal said basically that the employee Morrisons should have had a uh, cyber insurance to cover these sort of damages. In the High Court, Mar um, Morrison had a very good lawyer. Not that the class action lawyer was not as good, but Morrison's lawyer did a very good job on convincing the High Court that they hadn't done anything wrong and that the ex-employee was a data controller, so he was the only responsible. It can sound, I, I'm guessing lots of employee, employers, sorry, I keep going to employers, listening would think, well, why would Morrison be liable? They hadn't done anything wrong. Then if it's the only liability of the ex-employee, so how the other employee could get any damage compensation for the data. So that, that's an issue. And there, there was this case that I uh, badly mentioned uh, I saw today on LinkedIn. Don't have much to tell about it, but it's a um, German court that said that not every data breach would uh, give a compensation. Um, in UK, we have the Lloyd case, class action against Google, where they had the green light to go forward. And they said that the loss of control and the psychological distress worth compensation. We still have to wait and see where it all goes. Uh, the, the problem with data breach is the consequences are not immediate. Data breach is stolen, they are sold on black markets or they are just thrown away everywhere. And sometimes, many years later, someone's ID is misused or financial uh, details misused. Yeah, I think the problem, I mean, that we just can't get around is that a lot of times the harm happens before the law. And if the enforcement doesn't happen soon enough or the remediation or, you know, happen, you know, cause once the, once the milk is spilled out of the, the carton, uh, it, you know, it's almost impossible to get that back. So that's why it's really important that that data be protected the best way possible and that individuals have more control over their data and that it not be spilled milk. I think it's really interesting that you're, you know, so you've been in, uh, a lawyer in France, you lived in Germany and lived in now live in the UK, so you have, you know, the full <laughs> Europe experience, right, <laughs> from different countries and, and different ways that they look at things. Um, I love your thoughts, you know, at, at me being an American and um, you being in Europe, uh, as we have so many people around the world working in data privacy, I hear sometimes people say there's like a difference between the way American privacy folks think about privacy as opposed to European people. I want to know if you had any thoughts about that. Yes, privacy is very much connected to the cultural understanding of how we perceive uh, our intimacy. I think Americans, for example, you don't like much people touching you, <laughs> while more um, Mediterraneans are all touchy and, and it's different. We had a discussion on Facebook not long ago about what's the difference between privacy and data protection. But for me, privacy is a fundamental human right. Uh, it's more of a philosophical concept, while data protection is more the data that is collected that needs to be protected and the way that we are allowed to collect or not to collect. Right. And someone posted a picture of a toilet with uh, glass walls. Some people think, well, privacy is secrecy and I have nothing to hide, so why would I care about privacy? And I, I quite like to tell them, well, when you go to the loo, you close the door. 
It's just somebody who would like to be in peace. <laughs> However, going back to history, actually France was well known. In Versailles, um, novelties used to do those things in public and they would show it as a way of saying, well, I'm healthy. There was no barrier. So no problem going to the loo and showing everything you do in a loo and to everyone. So things have changed. The, the, the understanding and the, the way we perceive privacy change. And it's also changed from culture to another culture. I've had people in Sweden telling me, well, we go naked in a sauna and we don't care about privacy. And then I reply, well, you choose to go to the sauna. You choose who you're sitting with. And if you're not happy, it's not a huge sauna. There are a certain number of people. You don't like them. You just go away and you go to another sauna. With your privacy online, it's different. You have absolutely no control on what's being done with your data. And this is where privacy gets very close to data protection. Uh, a few years ago, I had a chat with a IT person about privacy and data protection. And while we were chatting, I Googled her. And I find so much private stuff about her online. And I just sent her a link. And she felt like, oh, you're invading my privacy. I said, tell Google. Right. <laughs> I just Google your name, put speech mark, right. and see everything that comes out about you. Yeah. Uh, and this, even for someone who is in IT, is, is, that was three years ago. I, I'm hoping today people understand that a bit more. But Google does the job of a puzzle different pieces of puzzle in one click put next to each other that shows a whole picture that you have no control on. Right. It could be your own post, but it could be someone else destroying your reputation. Absolutely. Right, exactly. I think for people who aren't online or don't have a very good presence or good full presence online, it's unfortunately an opportunity for people to fill it in with bad things or things that aren't true. Uh, so it's very important, I think, for people to really step out and establish their identity so that people know, you know, oh, this is Tara, this is Debbie, you know, I, you know, so they can differentiate the truth from the fact from fiction, basically. I would love to get your thoughts on the, the Shrimps 2 decision and the invalidation of the uh, privacy shield between the EU and the U.S. What are your thoughts about that? It's a case been ongoing for a few years. First, the previous um, adequacy decision that was the privacy um, safe harbor agreement was invalidated by the European Court of Justice. Um, nothing was changed. So Maximilian Schrems, who is behind this case, who founded the None of Your Business um, NGO, he continued his battle, and eventually in July uh, this summer, the European Court of Justice again said that despite uh, the European Commission giving the green light after the second year of um, uh, reviewing the privacy shield, it should be invalidated. It's not because the U.S. does uh, intelligentsia that Europeans don't do. Right. I think every country today has intelligence here. Absolutely. And they try to grab information. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with the U.S., as the European Court of Justice saw, is that it is the, um, there is no sufficient judicial review. Right. Um, there is a sort of uh, discrimination against EU, EU citizens who don't have a right to redress. Right. So until things are changed, which is the FISA Section 702, the Executive Order 12333, and other intelligence um, regulation Clyde Act, and uh, things that allow the U.S. to intercept data, ECJ said no more transfer of data from the EU to the U.S., in principle, standard contractual clauses uh, are still valid. So are the binding corporate rules. So a lot of people jumped up and say, oh, they're valid. Let's continue as we did before. However, ECJ is saying that additional measures should be taken to make sure that the data that is exported from the EU and imported to the U.S. 
is kept safe and no access is given to the US government and the EU citizen got the right. Personally, I don't see many ways that this could be done. Right. We can go closer. Mm -hmm. We can, data can be encrypted. And the encryption key should remain within the EU. Mm -hmm. Clauses could be added to the standard conclusions clauses that are being modernized uh, by the commission. That's right. It's still not there. Some data protection authorities, like the German ones, have been very strict, saying no more transfer of data from the EU to the US. French said, we are thinking about it. English said, well, standard content are valid. Be careful what you're doing. But who can stop the trade, basically? I know I'm, I'm not very exactly repeating what they said, but that's what comes out. But... England, uh, UK is concentrate on Brexit. Yeah, suffering itself on will they get the um, adequacy decision or not? So that's another issue. But what is very interesting with the uh, Schrems decision is basically, ECJ is saying we Europe want a strong protection to data, and some are like. If this was a kind of FRID, RFID, sorry, that follows the data wherever it goes, mm -hmm. the country of import should give the same level of protection to the to this data, which is quite strong. Yes. But hopefully, it, it's a good message that will pass. Uh, we had an interesting case in France, if, if I may uh, mention that. Data Hub is a cloud that stores all medic French medical data, especially since um, the COVID. Um, the CNIL um, said to the highest administrative course in France, the Conseil d'État, that this data should not be put in the hands of Microsoft. So that is confirmation that what we call, what the ECG sees as a transfer of data is not a physical transfer of data from the EU to the US. Because all these American um, US laws applies to US companies, even though if their servers are based in Europe, still US government can intercept the data. Right, yes. This is why the German Data Protection Authority's position is map your data, check where it goes, and if you're using US companies, rethink it. That's a major step. And I've been watching this play out for like over 20 years. So, you know, when Safe Harbor was was uh, put in place and then when it was invalidated and the privacy shield, I don't know what a third try at adequacy would be between the the U.S. and the EU, obviously there's a lot of trade between, you know, the countries. So there's obviously probably more of an economic imperative than a privacy one. But I think we just have fundamental thoughts or differences about how we think about privacy. So in my view, the U.S. is like commerce over privacy. And the EU is like, you know, we want to do commerce, but you have to respect our privacy. <laughs> So uh, that's sort of an impasse, I feel. And then the, the redress issue is a very serious one because in the Privacy Shield, they tried to have a sort of a method of redress within the uh, Department of Commerce. I guess the, the big issue in my view, well, two, two issues in my view. One is that the Department of Commerce only covers certain types of industries, so it's not almost all industries as opposed to the GDPR. And then also the redress because the Department of Commerce again is limited in the companies that they uh, oversee means that, you know, like for example, like I, if like, let's say for instance, I have a problem with the U.S. company while I'm here in the U.S., I don't have that level of redress that the Europeans are asking for. So, there, there would really have to be a, a total rethinking of how that 
mechanism could be created in a way that would make it palatable, I think, to the EU. But then I think that would cause a lot of people in the U.S. to say, well, why can't I have that right? Because we don't have that right now in terms of the way that the way that you guys are thinking about redress. Uh, I would love to ask, you had written something a while back about consent fatigue, uh, and I think this is a big issue. So where a lot of people are, you know, you're signing up for these companies with different services and you're constantly getting bombarded with cookie notices and different things like that. And some people just, they just click through. So uh, give me your thoughts about consent fatigue. Well, the um, cookies are ruled by the EPC directive, which is under revision. It's been ongoing. Uh, however, as for the constant, the, it would be the same level uh, and standard of the GDPR. Um, we are now seeing more and more um, uh, websites that um, got cookie banners asking consent before dropping the cookies. Actually, cookies are also under the Schrems to a, a consider as a transfer of data to the US. For a website that got Google Analytics or Facebook content or other cookies that send the data to the US, it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue. We see the constant banners. I've noticed with a few people who did research that sometimes in some website, although you did not consent on cookies or before even you would say yes or no, cookies were dropped. Um, I saw several law firms website who had that. One major law society website had cookies. And when we speak about cookies, it, it's the generic term, but it also includes any kind of um, um, tracing, um, some JavaScript, um, pixels, and they all collect data. When you have sensitive clients, if I may call it as a law firm, it's an issue. Um, it's a lot of third parties to know who came to your website, what they did, and whichever website they also visited. And it could be that someone else who used the same device could actually know where you've been and what you've been doing. So when a law society encouraged victims of domestic abuse to visit their website, and on which there are cookies, it's, it's, it's a serious issue. Depending on the kind of visitors and customers you have, you have to be very vigilant with what is collected. People are today very much annoyed because every website you want to visit, you first have to decide if you want a cookie or not. It is a pain, but I'm hoping eventually they will stop having any cookies. Yeah. I, well, so a lot of tech companies, because of the uh, a lot of the laws about cookies, have been eliminating cookies. They're, they're collecting data in other ways, but the law hasn't caught up with that yet. So I think by the time that these cookie cases get uh, settled, very few people will actually be using them. They'll be on to whatever the next evolution in technology may be. Uh, I would love to talk with you about the right to be forgotten. Uh, this is something that you talk about and you've written about um, a bit. For companies, it's the most difficult thing in the GDPR for them to acquiesce to because the right to be forgotten means that they have to figure out what they have in terms of data about individuals and how they, you know, remove it from an organization and how they communicate that to the individual uh, data subject. What are your thoughts about that? On the question of knowing which data is hold and where it is, I think this, this is something very important, and, and GDPR is a, a based on accountability principle. It's ask the organization to sit and think which data they hold, do the, that mapping, know where it goes, who access to it, for how long they retain it. These are the seven principles of data protection on, on GDPR. My favorite principle is data minimization. If you don't hold the data, you don't have the burden of the data. 
if you don't need it, delete it. I agree. I agree with you on that. It's, it's as simple as that. It's actually good for you. You don't pay for data storage for nothing. Another uh, principle is data accuracy. What's the point of holding data that is out of date? Your marketing right. is all wrong. Your everything is wrong because the data is obsolete. So delete it. You don't need it. Um, I usually like to advise a, a three-level uh, storage of data. First level, active data with more access and also internet access. Seven level, you have to keep the data because you might need it for different reason because they're also, you know, a tax reason, employment reason. You have to keep the data for a certain number of years. You have to sit and decide your data retention periods depending on the level of data and what you want. But limit data to this second level storage. Third level storage would be archiving, no internet access, very limited access to any third parties. Because sometimes for historic reason, you need the data. Right. Um, I've been asked, well, what happened? Uh, we had all this historic um, data of people who became famous or were famous and visited the hotel or a museum. We would want to keep that forever. Well, you can keep it. Just don't put it online. Mm -hmm. Keep it on the... Um, external hard drive that are not connected to internet. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to do that. It's not a problem. Oh, yeah. What people have to understand is internet connection, globalization means easy access to data, easy misuse of data. But if the data is safe, encrypted on your hard drive and not connected to internet, it's safe. You can keep it as long as you want. There's no problem with that. Right. That's what is good with the GDPR. It's, it's, cause people organization to sit and think what they've got, how much they are holding, who is accessing to it, how they keep it secure. It's all common sense. Yeah. I think though with the internet age, because I, I don't know, like um, I guess to use for example, like Google, when, when Google first started or Microsoft first started giving people free email addresses, you know, the size of your email box was, you know, relatively small. But over the years, they made the size of the email boxes bigger. So as a result, people just collect more stuff and they delete less stuff because they have more room. So in some ways, I feel like the, the internet age has made people digital pack rats where they keep so much stuff, you know, because, you know, instead of like, let's say, before you had books in the library, now you can have things on a hard drive and people are less apt to, to delete things. Also, you know, I've worked a lot with, uh, you know, corporations and lawyers and sometimes um, people want to keep data just because they think they may need it, even though they don't have a real reason to keep it. And that just piles up over year over year. And to me, those are some of the, you know, especially if they're connected to the Internet, a lot of times, um, you know, they have old data, it may be on old servers, it may be on something that's more vulnerable than maybe their active data. And hackers like that, that's just a gateway for them to get into the, your organization. And it also creates more risk for the company because now you have people accessing or you, you have a breach where someone's looking at some old stuff you don't even know what's there. So now you have to go through and figure out, you know, whose data is on here. So it's just a mess. I think Data retention is a is a big problem worldwide, where people are just keeping way too much stuff. Indeed, I, I call it the Google hype. Once Google started to collect everything, and it was known that Google is 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 saving all data, and storing and collecting became much much cheaper. So people thought, oh, "Let's collect, and then we will see what we do with it." But that caused issues, that, that, that there are serious security issues with over-collecting data. Data breach cause harm, unfortunately. Um, and cases like Morrison's, um, they will happen again. Yeah. Um, employees are not devoted to their employer as they used to be. There, there is a much bigger turnover. Young people just change job. Um, if they're not happy, they will want to take revenge, and it's so easy. Get the USB yeah. and put it online. Yeah. So, yeah, data minimization is very important. 
um, and the right to be forgotten. Um, before the GDPR, there was a right to be forgotten by the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice, and that was more delinking than actually deleting. Um, Correct. Sometimes you do need internet and the whole world to forget about something silly that you did one day in your life. Yes. Because employers search you online. Um, everyone search you online. Um, young people today are born with their uh, baby pictures online and e even the embryo is, is already online before they were born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a very interesting interview of... Um, ex-Google CEO, and he suggested that young people should be able to change identity at the age of 21 because they've got already so much behind them of silly things they've done. Yeah. But that's not feasible, no. We, yeah. we can't just rub it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. We have to give a chance to people to redo their life. Everyone does a mistake. Yeah. The problem with internet is you just need someone with a camera next to you to make it immemorable. Exactly. We've had lots of exchange and debate uh, this week um, on social media about France who wants to pass a law that forbids anyone to uh, record police officers doing their work and post it on social media. In my interpretation of GDPR already today, we should not be able to post anyone's pictures online without their consent. And this is very important. I really ask everyone to reconsider before posting online. Mm -hmm. Ask the person if they're okay. There are people with spe special circumstances. There are people who are in the middle of a divorce. They don't want to tell where they are and what they're doing. Right. Yeah. They are uh, protected witnesses. They don't want people to know where they are and their face would identify them. Mm -hmm. Facial recognition software are for everyone they can use. The, um, it can identify, and worse than identifying, it can make fake identification. Absolutely. So you might be identified as a criminal while you are not at all a criminal, but go and try to prove it wasn't you. Yeah. Everyone is just attacking you. So a police officer video that is posted on social media it would be one extract of something that happened. You don't know what was the start and you don't know how it finished. Right. They are police officers. I'm not saying why I am not defending at all police violence. I'm just saying that the judge had studied for that. They are institution for judging and it's not the work of social media to judge the act of a police officer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They can post by blurring the uh, faces yeah. But there should never be anything posted with identifying pictures without asking the person. That's very important. Yeah. Um, people have to start to understand that it has consequences. Absolutely. And I thought also the, the other way around um, discussion with police officer in my area and giving the name of a, a young offender, 18 year old, who is suspected having killed someone with a knife might be true but I want a judge to tell me what he did and what he did was a crime yeah it's not the social smiths at work and once the local police put that on Facebook it means that the whole family is ashamed the siblings are ashamed they go to school the next day and they say hmm, your brother killed someone we don't want to talk to you anymore right yeah. when he got the COVID that say oh I don't talk to you because you've got fever yes. and who was your sibling <laughs> I don't talk to you we end up with not being able to talk to anyone right. Exactly, exactly. So th th these are things that change our relationship because of the social media. We get so many good things from it. Yeah. You know, I'm a, um, I, I'm a great believer on social media. Uh, I promote e-learning. I have a, a charity that promotes e-learning. I have nothing against internet and anything digital. I love technology. I'm a gadget lover. But... We have to accept that in the area of uh, social media and internet interconnection, relationship has changed. We are not just uh, broadcasting in our small network. When we broadcast, we broadcast it for the whole world. Right. Broadcast it at the highest speed ever. And we broadcast it forever. Exactly. So it's a, the catalyst of internet is 
changing all scales. Absolutely. We have then, on the other hand, be more careful with what we're doing and what we're saying. And it's so easy to just push a button and send it out. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you're right. I think we need to, you know, I'm like you. I love, I love um, technology. I was really excited, you know, when the internet came into existence because uh, I grew up without the internet, obviously. But uh, I'm a gadget lover as well. But I think we also have to be cognizant of the harms that can happen. So we can't just all be so so excited about the innovation without understanding that there can be harm. So we have to really be able to educate around that. The GDPR has been, as you know, very influential around the world. So we're seeing laws come out that are taking bits and pieces of the GDPR and incorporating them into their laws. So I think there's going to be more regulation around data privacy and not less uh, in the future. We know even got in China a G similar to GDPR uh, um, legislation that is coming up. So even China. Yeah, even China. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. And thank you again. Thanks so much. My great pleasure. Thank you, Debbie. Bye.